Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready now? Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. It is my pleasure to participate and celebrate in the launching of males in tertiary and tertiary education in Jamaica. This book marks a significant milestone in research and conducted by my colleague and co-author, Dr. Herbert Gale and Keisha Bryan. Dr. Gale Herbst, as he is known across campus, has spent over 20 years of his academic career researching both the underlining cause and solution of male underachievement and gender violence across the region. The co-author, co-authored with Ms. Bryan, is the, who is the program director of Vision 2030 Jamaica, and works concurrently in the Institute, Planning Institute of Jamaica. Upon reviewing this book, you will notice that the book is an example of great collaborative work, and it gives perspective from different spectrums, more so Herbs being a social scientist and Tisha being a sociologist. The detailed analysis in the book brings attention and solution to issues that have an impact on males in tertiary education not only in Jamaica, but across the wider Caribbean. The book highlights the larger conversation on issues including social mobility, economic inclusion, and gender equity. Male and tertiary education in Jamaica is actually the result of five years of qualitative research examining the relationship between men and tertiary education. Gail and Brian focus experiences and perceptions of three sets of young men, those who did not qualify to enter university, those who qualified but, by, but bypassed tertiary education, and those who qualified but for, but for varying reasons have delayed entry into university. Using rigorous in-depth interviews to capture the experiences of 186 males between the ages of 18 and 39, compared to those of seven to four females of the same comparative age group, the authors examine the realities of males regarding their vision or ability to attend university in Jamaica. The main findings of the book you will see found that men's comparative absence from universities in Jamaica is cultural. Spurred by the world phenomenon of women's liberation, Jamaican families shifted their support towards educating women to the effect that female enrollment in tertiary education increased from 64% of men in 1971 to 228% of men in 2011. Participation in tertiary education in Jamaica is unquestionably gender, and this work is the first book-length scholarly response to the question of why men are not attracted to tertiary education in Jamaica. I can't think of a more important or timely topic, and I'm pleased that this book was published by the University of the West Indies Press and is available both locally from the University of the West Indies Press and via Amazon. For my university colleagues, you can actually purchase this book using your book grant via the University of the West Indies Press. Just a quick overview um, owing to COVID protocols. Our program is going to be very short and complex as such. Um, first, we're going to have opening remarks by our principal, Professor Dale Weber, who is also the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. Then we're going to have remarks by our Dean, Professor David Tedden from the Faculty of Social Sciences. Then we're going to have remarks by the head of the department for the Department of Sociology, Psychology and Social Work, Dr. Orville Taylor. Now, over to you, Professor Weber. Thank you very much, Dr. Obermuller, Program Chair for this afternoon. Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Tennant. Head of the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work, Professor Dr. Professor Dr. Orville Taylor. Dr. Herbert Gale and Ms. Patricia Brand, authors of this book. Colleagues online, good afternoon to you all. I'm delighted and grateful to be here 
to bring greetings at this text launch, Males and Tertiary Education in Jamaica. We are the premier tertiary institution, and we know that there are problems. It is unusual, however, to have internal research demonstrate the answers that we've been looking for administratively in the way that this book has done. And for that, we're grateful. We wish to congratulate Dr. Gale and Ms. Bryant. This publication spans scholarship in factors that influence males' access to tertiary education. The authors have highlighted many issues that we thought of, that we have heard. Now we have hard data, we have facts, we have information which allows us to draw the right conclusions. The UWI AAA strategy has the first A as access, but is access real when only some can access? Notwithstanding that, we know that we have been working to have 70% of our students be first time university matriculants, meaning from their family. But it is worrying when only 30% of those are males, and that's an improvement, by the way, and 83% will pass, and only 62% will complete. Just yesterday, the Mona School of Mona Social Services Township Project, we were able to give out 10 scholarships. Six of them were to males, and for that we were pleased, because we are trying to make a difference. The statistics in this book are frightening at times, but it is reality, and we must come to grips with it. The lack of access to tertiary education on account of non-qualification or financial situations or social situations is of importance. And while we have information which will help us find the right tools to try and resolve the problems. The volume is groundbreaking. I'd like to congratulate the authors for their work. I'd like to congratulate the University Press for having taken this on as a project. And I'd like to thank the Faculty of Social Sciences and the department for demonstrating its continued relevance as the UWI continues to make a difference in Jamaica, the Caribbean, and the world. I look forward to a wonderful book launch, and I enjoy reading the document. Good afternoon. Principal Weber, other distinguished colleagues and guests, authors of this wonderful book that we're launched today, Chairperson, good, good afternoon. I want to thank Dr. Gail and Mr. Grant for this opportunity to give remarks on the occasion of the launching of this important work. I am well aware that your audience is in to hear you speak about your work, not to hear you pontificate about something that they very little about. So I'll keep my remarks very short. I'm sure that I don't have to speak to the importance and the relevance of this work, both tertiary institutions as well as to the society at large, that is self-evident. Um, nor do I have to speak about the credentials of the esteemed authors of, of this book. First author has already established himself as the leading expert in the region on these matters. So what will I speak about? I limit my talk this morning to one of the few topics that I know a little bit about, the, the social sciences. You know, I have been told that I'm an economist who thinks that reasons like a sociologist. But reading parts of this book, it seems that the authors are sociologists or anthropologists who write like well-reasoned economists. But that is the, the beauty of the social sciences, isn't it? We all study human behavior. We may focus on different aspects of that behavior. We may utilize different tools to look through different lenses. But in the end, we're all studying the same human beings. And in a world of abstractions and caricatures that lead to often distorted perceptions of reality, this book is a refreshing, holistic study of human behavior. The study was designed to answer narrowly circumscribed questions, but because of the holistic approach taken, it is able to provide insights of far greater societal value. As an example, on page 237 of the book, the authors conclude that attaining tertiary education depends as much on the ability of the individual to engage in the process of tertiary education based on accessibility and median requirements as it does on the relative weight of tertiary education in the individual's goals and sense of identity. And on page 27, they further note that education was valid by all respondents, especially education ending at the secondary level. However, they note that tertiary education was viewed as a separate entity with varying degrees of value and attachment. So, so what determines the weight that individuals place on tertiary education? What determines these varying degrees of value and attachment? 
And do these weights and value attachments differ by sex, by class, or by any other distinguishing characteristics? Colleagues and friends, these are the critical questions that a country such as Jamaica must answer. A country which is trying to find its way into the fourth industrial revolution. They are critical, critical for a country seeking to move beyond the vulnerable basic primary and basic service industries into industries with greater value added, which are integrated further up in the value chain. Well executed tertiary education is a critical ingredient in that progression. So we need to understand the factors that stand in the attainment of such education. In this volume, the authors provide answers by examining three categories of people who did not attend university. The non-qualifiers, the bypassers who didn't attend despite qualifying, the delayers who qualified intent to attend in the future but have delayed entry. Now, I won't speak to the results of the study, both because I don't want to spoil it for you when you purchase and read the book for yourself, even more so because I haven't really read that far just as yet. But I must admit, though, that I couldn't resist skipping ahead. And I was happy to find concrete institutional policy recommendations which would make any applied economist with a sociological leaning pro. Colleagues and friends, the Faculty of Social Sciences here at the University of West Indies is committed to and driven by our FSS REACH vision. And the very first plank in that vision is conducting relevant, impactful research. Dr. Gaines, Brian, conducting this research and writing this book have added significantly to the pool of insightful, impactful, relevant knowledge that the Faculty of Social Sciences has created through our research. By doing so, they will no doubt fuel another plank of our vision, that is evidence-based advocacy aimed at the growth and development of our country and our region. Dr. Gaines, Brian, commendations on your solid, relevant, impactful research I look forward to finish reading the book, and even more so, to seeing how your research will be used to create meaningful, positive change. Thank you, and commendations. And uh, the task now falls to me. I, I'm not just going to say all Curtis is observed, because I want to physically and literally directly acknowledge the presence of our principal, PVC Dale Weber. And I want to thank you for the unstinting support that you have given to us within this Faculty of Social Sciences and, of course, the Department of Sociology, Psychology and Social Work. I want to also acknowledge our Dean, a man who is so straight that he perhaps doesn't have a protractor in his geometry set, a man who is so direct, um, who at the same time has given us a kind of leadership without being too obtrusive. And I want to thank you, David, for your unstinting support as well. But I want to say this to all of you, as well as to you two gentlemen. Um, welcome. But as the word on the road goes, it's dull. And I say dull because there is nothing here that is new to me. I'm very happy that you are taking the opportunity to become even more familiar with the things that you knew. We believe in the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work, and we have always believed in a AAA. And the AAA, of course, is solid academics. And then, of course, you have activism. And uh, at the same time, we have advocacy. For the history of this department, and we can talk about the work of Hermione McKenzie, we can talk about June Dolly Besson, we can talk about Don Robotham, and of course, there is a bias that the three of us in here who knew him would have, and that is St. Barry or Alston Barrington Chavans. And the spirit of Barry Chavans pervades what the department has been doing over the years, but most important, the work that Herbie and Pisha have been carrying out. But not just that work, because this work, because the interesting thing is, you know, some of us are sociologists, some of us are anthropologists. And the weird thing about it is that many of us learned our sociology from anthropologists. And at the same time, we have sociologists who teach anthropologists. So as a consequence of that, we have had this wonderful cybernetic relationship, and that continues. So it is no accident that we have the head of vision, the Vision 20, 
Vision 2030, being an individual who was trained in this department. Because we were trained in a period where we understood very clearly that we had to cross the gap between theory and practice and theory and praxis. But we also learned how to think systemically, not just systematically. So without any question, we understand that there is that direct relationship between post-secondary education, tertiary level enrollment, and all of the other kinds of social antipathies that exist. We've been doing this long before it became fashionable, because that's our essence. So I want to take the time to say thank you, colleagues, for bringing light to something. But here's another part of it. In the spirit of Barry Shabans, that still affects us, that still infects us. We don't only do work that is socially relevant. We don't just do work out of which you can extrapolate policy. As difficult as it is, that is very difficult. And that's easy though, very easy. The harder thing to do is to cross the gap between the research and your advocacy, the things that you say that you stand for, and you walk that walk. So when you decide that you are going to take your research and you put it directly as a public servant in public policy where you oversee something that is going to redound to the benefit of the Jamaican people and the Caribbean people on the whole later on, or when you decide that you're going to write this thing that is policy relevant, but at the same time, it doesn't fall too far from your activism in Father's Inc. And when we walk out and we go in the trenches, and we try to make a difference. I want to thank you, Principal. I want to thank you, Dean, because we are all aligned in a way that will be agile, but for the benefit of our nation, our region, and of course, the world. I want to thank you. Bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, my HOD just mentioned Professor Barry Chavans, and if you just look above me, there's a photo of Professor Chavans. Maybe that's why I'm sitting in this great seat under the great man. At this point, I wish to thank Professor Dale Weber, Professor David Tennant, and Dr. Orville Taylor for your remarks. For those who are joining us, thank you again. And just so you know, the book is available via the UWI Press at a cost just about 60 US of $8. And you can use your book grant to access a copy. At this time, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Karen Carpenter, who is the head of the Institute for Gender and Development Studies here at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. Over to you, Dr. Carpenter. Hi, I'm Dr. Karen Carpenter, head of the Institute for Gender. And I'm really happy to be here to congratulate Herbert Gale and Keisha Bryan on their book, Males in Tertiary Education. Karen Carpenter. This is a significant work, and I'm already looking forward to the second volume. So before I get ahead of myself, let's talk a little bit about what we find in this book. It's going to be with us for a long time as a reference to data on the situation that males and females face in Jamaica and how those are here. And I think that's one of the useful gender lenses that this book offers. Naturally, when we read this book, we think about Barry Chavans's learning to become a man. Well, Barry Chavans's learning to become a man sets the stage for this book, which is learning to become an educated man. So this book by Brian and Gail shows us the challenges, it shows us the situations that males in Jamaica face and how those compare with females. It's interesting because it takes a deep dive into the sociocultural and psychosocial issues within the culture. It does not ignore the culture, but it shows you the backdrop and context of how it is that young men are navigating their way across the developmental lifespan. So from they enter school until they make the decisions about whether or not tertiary education is gonna be of use to them, we have some challenges that they face and indeed some opportunities and those are there as well. 
I think that what struck me most about this book is that it didn't ignore the gender equity issue, which is that gender equity is a human rights issue. It's neither about males or females, but it's about both and the LGBT plus community as well. When we speak of gender, we speak in the widest, broadest possible terms about how our gendering affects our prospects in life. And I enjoyed the read because it provides us with substantial data. There is no doubt about the quantity of data that it provides us with, with and how we can examine that data in light of our developmental goals for the nation. We I have developmental goals to say that both males and females ought to be achieving this tertiary education. I think it also asks the question, why achieve tertiary education and who needs it? And in light of a decision to bypass tertiary education, what are the other developmental plans we have for males in particular, and certainly males who interact in that larger social environment called the family? We find that the males in the study have pulls on their time, their resources, their prospects, both from their immediate relationships as they get older and the extended relationships of the family. They take on new, new responsibilities, particularly financial responsibilities of care, but do not let go of their previous responsibilities. So family of origin issues remain with them and they're expected to provide and straddle both sets of economic um, responsibilities. And that certainly is one of the obstacles for men who are trying to get ahead in the education system. I'm pleased to see how Gail and Bran have examined the issues that come up in their interviews, that come up in their data set, because they do not take it in a vacuum. And so often when we talk about gender, we look at gender in a vacuum. We must look at it in the context of the other issues that surround the people we're speaking of. So the educational structure and how education has been unchanging in, in, in large part and has been structured in such a way as to impede what might be the cultural dictates of what maleness means and masculinity means. And indeed, we've, from Evans, been talking about how education rewards femaleness. And I think we see that in the lived experiences of the respondents. The researchers categorize their respondents into three separate groups. And I must tell you that I enjoyed reading about each group. I enjoyed the way the data was presented because it allowed me to, as I say, get a deep dive into, for instance, a category they call the non-qualifiers, people who simply do not meet the matriculation requirements, drop out of school early, or simply don't pass at high enough levels to enter into tertiary education. Then we have the bypassers, a very interesting group, those who qualify but decide tertiary education is not for me. And then we have, of course, the third group, which is the delayers. And I'll start with the non-qualifiers. They give us a number of reasons why they haven't seen education as their route to success why they may have done badly in school. And many of them speak to the interpersonal relationships that they did not have with that structure called a school environment or the educational environment, where there wasn't a mentor, where there wasn't a guiding force. And a number of them are not looking to their own fathers as role models. And that for me was very interesting. They may be looking at someone else in the society, someone else in their community, someone who's been successful and has indeed bypassed. And the bypassers now, as we come to them, look at their family of origin and look at the successes. And even with the females, look at the successes of their fathers. That was also very interesting because where their fathers were entrepreneurs, uh, small business owners, or had started some enterprise of their own, even the females, not just the males, sought to emulate them. And the influence for success in their lives was how well the father figure or, or extended family father did 
in their lives. And that for them was a model, even though mothers played a critical role in their upbringing. This was what was their uh, public, if you like, um, propeller into the society. We look at the last group, which is the delays. And I found that data very interesting as well, because we tend to think that if someone doesn't get into tertiary education immediately after secondary school, then they're lost. And we really bemoan all of the things that could have happened to them if they'd had a tertiary education. But the delays do indeed have a plan, do indeed have a goal. Uh, and what they tend to do is to take care of their primary responsibilities until they can somehow afford what that tertiary education opportunity brings to them. Affords in terms of time away from the family, affords in terms of resources, and affords in terms of being able to complete this tertiary education. Very interesting fact for me as I read was the fact that the male population tended to have goals where the female population tended not to set goals early. It seems to me that that sort of says that the female population had more opportunities for diverse avenues after school. And most females who delayed education were actually delaying education because they had a parent that they had to take care of, they may have had a pregnancy early, but they delayed their education not because they had no opportunity to complete and due to pulls in both directions as the males experienced, but rather because there was some personal family issue or personal child caring issue that they were taking care of. So I think when we look at the landscape for men and women, boys and, and girls, we have to really consider what is our 2030 goal for the gendered experience of education and how do we make any sort of adjustment in the next decade that will impact the lives of our male population and what are the cultural expectations that we continue to place on them with regard to their masculinity such as education is not masculine and men don't need education and men don't need um, all of these other things that help them to progress and indeed if they're going into uh, joining the economic world early what are the trade opportunities that we provide for them that are not stigmatized? It's a very interesting read. I enjoyed very much the discussion portion, which comes after quite a substantial portion of data. And it provides what Yuval Harari, historian, calls the under the skin data. It tells us the why of how our males are faring in the education system. I recommend it highly. I'm certainly going to be using it in my own classes. And I want to congratulate Herbert Gale and Pisha Brand for an excellent work. And I'm looking forward to volume two. Thank you. And we have some remarks from Mrs. Chin. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, with limited funded available on campus, sponsorship is quite important for us, more so to hold such events. At this time, I would like to thank our sponsors Mrs. Enid Chin, who is the co-owner and director of Juicy Beef Limited. Mrs. Chin, thank you so much. Okay, I think we're trying to connect to Mrs. Chin.
The Juicy Patties family is very pleased to sponsor the launch of this much anticipated volume by Dr. Gail and Miss Brian that examines the relationship between males and tertiary education in Jamaica. This study is relevant to our development. Sponsor. Education and human development are inextricably linked, advancing not just the economic, social, and intellectual growth of the individual, but benefits entire communities. Also of significant relevance is the gendered analysis this study provides. It is said, human development, if not engendered, is endangered. Understanding our lived gendered experiences is crucial to truly addressing our needs as women and men experience the world in completely different ways with different needs and different vulnerabilities. And these needs are not based on biological differences between the sexes, but on the social construction of gender. Entrenched, culturally defined roles and responsibilities for male and female allow gendered injustices, disadvantages, and privileges to persist. Our solutions involve reshaping these norms. However, the conversation on gender often gets quite contentious. In the process of advancing our own points of view, we sometimes invalidate the experiences of others. This book adds to the conversation on gender disparities and provides a greater understanding of the experiences of persons affected. We hope that the understanding this provides translates to meaningful actions and participation at all scales. We have the opportunity here for grassroots experiences to inform leadership decisions that in turn facilitate an enabling environment for action and change. We all have a role to play. The challenges men face cannot be addressed without the support and participation of women. And similarly, the reverse holds true for the issues women face. As we seek to understand the issues, let us consider how we may all engage as individuals, parents, educators, leaders, members of the business community, service and religious groups, and the wider community. At Juicy Patties, we have over the years tried as best as possible to make our company a learning organization and an incubator for social change initiatives in the private sector. Two of our initiatives that were started almost two decades ago and are relevant to the issues at hand are our Juicy Advancement Program and our Youth Leadership Program. Our Advancement Program, offered at our head office and main manufacturing plant in Clarendon, is aimed at advancing numeracy and literacy. We are extremely proud of our team members, both men and women, who have seized this opportunity to change their own circumstances. Our youth leadership program strongly promotes volunteerism with an underlying idea that regardless how dire our circumstances may seem, we all have something very worthwhile to offer and that there are always needs in the society that we're capable of taking on and making a contribution. Dr. Galen, Miss Brian, congratulations on the book and we all thank you for your contribution. you have provided for us here today. I know many people from the department would have liked to come and impart in some of that juicy patties that we have here, but unfortunately, owing to COVID-19 protocols, they can. So we'll eat with you guys in thought, and just so you know that juicy patties are available across Jamaica, even at the airport, so get your juicy patties today. And before we get on to the most important event of today, I wish again to state where you can uplift a copy of the book. So the book is available by the UWI Press. You can request a copy online 
or you can purchase the same via Amazon. So now, without any further delay, I wish to introduce the authors, Ms. P Dr. Herbert Gale, who is a sociologist lecturer in the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work, and Ms. Pisha Bryan, who is the Program Director of Vision 2030 Jamaica Secretariat in the Planning Institute of Jamaica. Over to you guys. All right, let me say, let me just say good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and, and this is to all my friends, my colleagues from wherever on earth you are. Uh, I, I remember last night just idly calculating, you know, how wide we would have people listening and viewing today. And I think we, we have, I, I think I'd said 21 countries, I'd check back where we're 24 countries strong. And I want to just say to them, welcome to the UWI and welcome to the Faculty of Social Sciences. This is where a lot of us nerdy people spend our time. <laughs> Pisha is saying that she's not one of them, but uh, I will tell a little secret, <laughs> colleagues and friends. I taught her and she's a nerd. <laughs> yes, Pisha. You, I, I've actually quite idly uh, reflected on you know, who would be the the students I had with the, with the, with the most forthright cognition, and I'm pretty sure you would be one of them. And guess what? Uh, Edith Chin is actually one of the, the brightest students we've had here. So this is all family. She's not an outsider. She's actually a graduate of the Faculty of Social Sciences, our department to be specific. I want to take us for a little historic, historiographical journey. And I want to, to, to describe it that way. I, I want us to begin by looking at uh, where this problem comes from. So let's begin with, first of all, uh, the so-called crisis here that we experience at UWI. So in 1999, before I left for England, I left for England in 2000. And in 1999, I worked very closely with Professor Barry Chevans and the principal's office uh, sent us this crisis package suggesting that, you know what has happened? We have a whole bunch of students who have been given offers to, to come to the University of the West Indies, but they can't. And guess what? They are males. This was 1999. This is actually 21 years ago, to be precise. They are males. And so the principal's office was like, We've been seeing this trend. Why is it that the males, we offer them? And you could hear the passion. My God, it's hard for them to even get the subjects. And they get the subjects, and they applied, and we gave them an offer, and they're not coming. And then we checked. And the shocker was 33% of the same young men who said they couldn't come into UWE were involved in taking care of sisters, mothers and other persons, including some coming to the same UWI, they had to sacrifice their space to allow their sisters, and in seven cases, their girlfriends, to come to the UWI. So 21 years ago, we became troubled by this problematique, and we wanted to understand what was happening. By 2007, we had the real crisis, the real panic. Male registration dropped below 25% at the UWI. And you know when that hit the public, people were calling. And I remember one day Barry said, oh, God, I'm tired. Is that media? Uh, so we, we, we felt bombarded by people calling to find out. You know, and I remember somebody called Barbara Bludon. And she says, it's what, it's what type of world you know, helping to create? I, I love this woman. With 20% men? 20% 20, 20 men? And then she invited me on her radio program. Uh, this was RJR. Right. <laughs> Beyond the headline. Beyond, no, no, no. It's called. Oh, oh that, that's interesting. It's not Beyond the headline. Why did Beyond the headline came to my. I just came off it. That's interesting. But anyway, it's the main talk show of RJR. Uh, our HOD is one of the hosts. 
I think Emily Shield is, is another one of the books. And it's fascinating that as I sat with her, right, and we discussed the matter, she actually brought me in the studio. And we were there talking about what's happening. She said, you know what happened? Hmm? Young man? And I was so happy for the young man at the time. You know? <laughs> we don't have a sense of partnership in this country. It's either one or the other. Why we can't choose both? And I want I want to thank Barbara Gluna because she helped inspire the work. But by 2008, Barry called me. This is about nine months after the, after sitting down and hotline, right? Uh, with Barbara Glodan. Barry Shevans called me and he says, Herbie, come here. At the time I was his RA, I was his research assistant. And he says, the principal's office. And he was knocking his, knocking his hand on the, on the desk. The principal's office has finally decided that we are going to stop. Every time we have graduation, there's a lamentation about the men. This year, sorry folk, we have to report. It's so unfortunate, we have to report that only 21% of graduates are males. And he said to me, we are actually going to find some money and look at the problem. And that's how this project started. So by 2009, so I want to publicly thank Professor Gordon Shirley. He was the one who sat with Barry and myself and we hammered out a proposal as a direction. And we decided that we were going to work on two volumes. So, Pisha, we have a second volume that, that you, of course, you know we're working on. Volume one was to look at males and tertiary education overall, which is what we're launching today. And hopefully next year this time, <laughs> let's stick, stick ourselves to it, Pisha. We're going to be launching volume two. So volume one was about males and tertiary education, but volume two was to focus on the universities around us and to find out what is happening in terms of the challenge, the difficulty in getting into university and so forth. So, so, so volume one was supposed to be the, the, the larger philosophical frame of the whole thing, and, and which is why I'm so happy to have had Pisha, because if you know Pisha, when she begins to speak, you'll understand she is that. She is that belt of the philosophical and the abstract and the applied and the everything, all right? And then volume two was to look at all of those. So volume two, guess what? Volume two utilized integrated methodology and we covered close to 3,000 people because we interviewed people from 12 different universities to be able to, to, to dig even deeper than volume one, which is why you know, Dr. Karen Carpenter was so excited because I told her a little bit about volume two. Volume two is going to be the real thing after the real thing. All right. So let, let me let me let me go on quickly. Why the panic? Why why was there panic in 2007 and 2008? Why was there panic? Let's see if we see because sometimes people panic and the panic makes no sense. Did this panic make sense? Let's find out. All right, so not all of us want to see men with dollars and no cents. And if you missed this, I can't help you. Let me be very kind, just for adventure. There's one of my young children who's listening. This sense is S-E-N-S-E. -E. You don't want, your, you can see, and the women with me are nodding their heads because they don't really want a man with dollars and no cents. That's just hard. So that was actually one of the first motivation behind people getting behind this project. The second thing, of course, you know, you 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 want your women to have an MA, but also an MAN, right, Pish? <laughs> so you, you want the men to have dollars and cents, and you want the women to have an MA, but also an MAN, right? Even my technical team shaking their heads because they know it's true. You don't want to just have an MA, right, or MSc or any M, and don't have the M with the A and the N if you so desire, right? But I want us to look at the work a little bit of Agbamu, 2007. 
And you know what he said? He said, any country at all that goes down the road of focusing education on one sex rather than both sex cannot develop. I thought that was a bombshell. And I remember when I stated this at a meeting, there were a few persons who got really upset. In fact, I remember that meeting very well. This was an international meeting in which the woman who, who, was, who was cheering said, that statement is controversial. And I said, hell to the no. Have you ever seen a pigeon wing being clipped on one side? Because where I grew up in Sablamar, we used to clip the wings of just one wing on the pigeon. And we know it cannot fly anywhere. It just spin around in a circle. And she wasn't getting it until finally I said, you know what? Even though I was trying to avoid giving this woman a Jamaican saying, right, or a philosophy, let me give it to her. And I said, Mom, do you know what happens to fat puppies when you leave them among mother dog? Let me explain what that means. Take a fat puppy, place it beside a set of hungry, skinny, scrawny, mangy dogs. It will not do very well. And her mouth pop open. I get what you're saying now, sir. I said, yes, my dear. We have to get to a place of partnership where we can see precisely what Barbara Dugan was saying, going in a direction and what Obama is saying, that look, any country at all, and he said it without apology, any country at all you go to where there's a massive investment in one group of people and not in the other, you're going to have trouble. Herbert Spencer, 1870, suggests that education must not be seen as just a means towards income generation. You must also see education as a matter of character formation. And if you get that, then a lot of it is making sense. So how did we get here? How did we get to this crisis? So, so we've established that the crisis, that it was worth the panic. It was worth TVJ. It was worth all of these media houses getting into our friends. It was worth the concern of Barbara Gluden at the time. How did we get here? Let me take you all the way back to the British landing in the United States, what is now the United States. And within 29 years, they opened Harvard. Brilliant. Which suggested that in that particular setting, these set of people decided that we are going to live here. And if we're going to live here, we need to have a premier university. Let's switch now back to the Caribbean that was colonized for the purpose of production. Not civility, not society, production. It took 293 years after landing to open the doors of the UWI. Isn't that fascinating? Let's do the math. That's 10.2 times longer <laughs> than opening Harvard. And if you can understand that, then you understand what Agbo was so much concerned about. So let's jump to Woolmers being created. This was in 17, this was in 1729. But all of this, Woolmers and then Mannings and then JC, all of these early schools were for one set of people, white males, not Pisha, not me, not anybody in here, white males. And so if we understand that, then we understand how we got into some of these problems. And then we got to a point where the planters were very effective in laying pressure upon London, and the documentation of this is very clear, laying pressure on them so that the schools that were built in what we call phase three and four were for girls. So what is so by the time we get to 1970s, which was when the last set of schools were converted, we ended up with 15 all-girls schools and seven all-boys schools. And I'm fascinated when I say this to persons and they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, Herbs, how I live in Jamaica for so long and didn't know we have 15 hour girls schools? Seriously, Herbs? 15 hour girls schools and only some for boys? But that is Jamaica. And that's because the idea was really to force them onto the plantation. Because can you imagine I go take this, the, these young men, I go educate them when I, I, I'm, uh, we are driving an economy that is, of course, what? Labor intensive, not service oriented, uh, as we, we're going to discover. Let me go to number four. This, this little block I have for you in the history, in our historiography, 
is the self-injurious peasantry. But remember, people harm themselves if they are not taught what to need. Let me go again. And quite often I do presentations and I say to people, today I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And that's brave. Oh man, I've been called some names in Jamaica. I can't even say them. People just get really, really hurt because he is not saying what I want to hear. He's only saying what I need to hear. But some of us have to do it. So let's look at what was happening here. Take the idea of production, labor-intensive production for the, the, the new world, and let's put something equally disastrous in it. It's called patriarchy. Now, what you see emerging is a group of people convinced that once a young man can work his hands, can make sure mama, papa, and sister get food, we're good. So even if you don't have any money, you're a breadwinner because that's the tenets of patriarchy. And there's nothing more beautiful than to listen to the church speak about patriarchy and quote in Ephesians that, that the church make sure there's a ramification and there's a, there's a concretization of the point and the value of patriarchy rather than partnership. And that's, that has driven us into some decent places in hell. So by the 1970s, we had the third injection called the feminist movement. And, and remember, we only got full education in Jamaica by the 1950s. And then we had the Roots program under a prime minister called Michael Manley called Rely on Yourselves to Success Roots, right? And in that, women were not supposed to be subordinate to men. So all the patriarchal frames that people had were shattered politically. It, in fact, it was part of the political campaign. And then we had something called Two is Better Than Too Many. Be sure you're shaking your head like you remember those things. Two is better than too many. And you couldn't be Bev Brown. You couldn't walk around with three, four, five children and, and people would literally call you Bev Brown. So, so women were, were asked by moral suasion and by folk ways and by political campaigning and everything to switch childbearing to to examine self and to become a part of the production of the country. And th that revolution, my friends, took us into an interesting spin. So what happened? What came after that? Right after that, we begin to see, so at that specific period, only 64 women were attending university compared to 100 men. That was the 1970s. And then we got to what I call Block 5. How crabs in a coal pot with fire underneath it think it is a bath. Very long name for my Block number 5. But, but I want us to understand that. So men were in this pot, right? If you come from Southern Lamar, where I'm from, where people boil crab, right? You'll understand that. So the men were in this in this part called heavy industries, doing construction and going to do this and bauxite and, and the, the country was just flowing with everything. And I'm taking you into the work of, of one of my favorite persons in academia, Professor Patricia Anderson. And Prof Anderson says that there was a shift in her work. If you look at her work, there was a shift away as, as bauxite begin to fail, as these things begin to fail, the men's head just dropped down like, like the crab, right? And they were in this pot, the pot was beginning to boil, and they were like, wow, warm day, until the pot got really, really hot. When bauxite went, everything went, and we, we transferred to tourism and service industries, and now we have all kinds of systems where, where you know, it's, it's we're, we're doing call centers and all of these things. And by the way, these things don't require muscle. They do require you having education. And so in the 1970s and 80s, men were actually having a laugh at women. They were saying, ah, Chuck, Pisha, you have a degree, but may have more money than you. 
bear, right? And that was, that was actually the kind of, I'm dramatizing, but that was actually the cultural frame of what it was. And then things begin to change. By 2005, Jamaica became the most violent country on earth. Because let's be honest, if you have not changed the expectation you have of me, and I have no education, and I have no job because the heavy industries are gone, I have something left. It's called violence, it's called clandestine activities, it's called crime. And so we saw the crime just rocketing in Jamaica. Let's move to the sixth block. And I call it Edubuse Women. And this is a sad block. Edubuse. Yes, I, I have this bad habit of creating words. Edubuse. Educated, abused women. And what we started to find, in fact, I think Barry and myself started to notice it uh, from, I think, about the, the middle of the 1990s, where women were concentrating on ensuring that the men around there fund their education, and then the men would, would gang up on the women and beat them. So we were finding in five different blocks of, 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 of data from four different universities, the women with first class honors reporting more abuse than the, the regular women. And, the, and, and, and we started to dig into it and to say, why would you be so bright and be abused? But what we found out was that the men were backlashing on the women because there was no space for them to move forward. And then envy, of course, you know, comes with violence. If you don't want the person who's bigger than you more to be angry and to be so aggressive towards you. And so what we found, a lot of domestic violence. And, and then it, it fascinates me because when you look at this block, when you do the research and you speak with women, only, only literally 16% of women associate education with wealth. 16%. And, and by the way, we're talking here about interviews of over 1,000 women, which is I'm introducing you to volume two. 16% beach, 16% of women associate education and wealth. What women associate education with is self-esteem, self-actualization, being happy with self, having control of my life, and, and so forth. So it's not that, so I know there are some persons who say, oh, that's all naive, man, education, no, sir. But it's more than that. Now let's move to block seven, penultimate block. Violent, untrained men. And boy, this is where, let me borrow a, word, a, a term off the street. This is where, this is the block where it got real cray cray. Or crazy if you prefer. So at SOAS London, when I was doing my PhD, we did something that was really cray cray, if you, if you, if you want to use that word. We actually set up a team and we interviewed people from 127 countries to find out what are the four things or five things or six things or whatever. What are those things that make young people feel a sense, and Pisha likes this word, ontological security. What gives young people ontological security? And we found only four. I mean, we got 127 countries, young people from 127 countries flooding in information to us, but all they were saying were four things. And I bet everybody knows them. Number one, food. Number two, living in a community that is safe where you feel a sense of safety. Number three, having at least one consistent parent. At least one consistent parent. And number four, training and opportunity structures are opportunities to move forward. So if we use a boy who dropped out of school before grade nine, I am now going to give you a little peep of volume two, and this might frighten you. So settle down in your seats. If we are using a baseline called a boy who dropped out of school before grade nine or by grade nine, if that boy come, so we're going to compare that person as the baseline against the first set of boys, boys who finished secondary schools and did at least CXCs. For my English friends, that is, that is GCE or GCSE. Okay? All right. I can't have my friends in Germany. I, do, I don't know what their exams are called. <laughs> All right. I have a few friends who tell me from Germany who says, Herbs will be there, we'll be listening. So please, please say something about us. All right. <laughs> now, what is funny is that if a boy completed secondary school and did at least three CXCs, 
he is four times safer than the boy who dropped out of school. Shall we take, shall we shock you a little bit more? If you take him to Cape, no man, my English friends, Cape is A levels, right? If 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 you if he completes Cape, he is ten times safer. So four times safer if he finished and did three CXCs. Even if he don't pass them, he just did them, right? That group is large. He's four times safer. Ten times safer if he's go to Cape. And if you send him to university, brace yourselves, he's 85.2 times safer than a dropout. So before I take the final block, let's see if we can work out the, the philosophical dilemma of why people who have a handful of grains per week are the healthiest people in any block. Is it the handful of grains that make them so healthy, Pish? Or is it that the people who are healthy pursue a healthy lifestyle? And I'm going to say to you, it's the latter. If you have a boy who goes to university, it's not just the university that makes him the man he's going to turn out to be. It's the fact that you took time out in a country that says, boy, if you finish high school, huh? go work. Let me say that in English. Once you're through with secondary school, we are about to harvest you. You need to go and work to bring money back to the home. All right? Now, in, a, in an environment like that, if we have children and we make sure this boy make it all the way to university, that boy feels so special. So it is not just the university, but the symbolic side, right? Peter loves the symbolic. It's the symbolic side of understanding that everybody's investing in me. I'll never forget when I was 15 years old, I just finished high school, and people, and I was poor, like dog, dog, dog poor. And people said, why are you always so happy? And I said, because look around me. I am from Seton Crescent. How many persons around here finish school? I don't have a reason to be sad because I know symbolically all my siblings made sure that Herbie, you get food, Herbie, okay? And this is the essence of what I am saying. So let's take the final block. There are three risks involved in this book. When you read it, you expose yourself to three sets of risk. Not COVID though. The first one is that you may have started reading the book not knowing. After you know, you really now have a responsibility on your shoulders. Okay? The second risk is very, very simple. If you love falling asleep socially, it is going to wake you up. Because the data and the way in which they are put together and the structure of the thing makes us understand precisely what is happening because all the way through it is comparative. The third and final risk is that after reading it, and this is the risk I hope you will take, you will help somebody down the road. You will step down the road, you'll see a girl who is struggling, and you will say, but I had these books at the back, in the back room that nobody's using. And guess what? It was for my daughter at law, or my son at law, or, or for whatever. And you'll actually give them to somebody. In other words, let's go back to what Orville Taylor, my HOD, was saying. We here in this room right, believe in activism, and we hope we can engender that from this piece of work. Now I'm going to ask Pisha to help me break it down for you. Let's look at the main points in this, in this piece of work. What were the main findings? What were the main tenets of this piece of work? And as she goes through, I'll butt in and we'll have a conversation and we'll just help you understand these things. And in the next 10 minutes, we're done. So good afternoon. I am happy to be here. I must express um, thanks, thanks to the University of the West Indies for undertaking or choosing to undertake this study. And I especially thank Dr. Gale for including me not just in this study, but 
Um, as an undergraduate student, I became involved in inner city research and a research um, focused on gender. So I, I developed that interest for development. I had an interest on development for development from before. But working with Dr. Gale, I really, I think, developed an appreciation for what feminism is in terms of partnership. And he knows I, I, I like to speak about partnership and equity. And I think that's why I, I chose to pursue the current uh, career path that I have. Now, I'm going to go quickly. I know you got all the exciting stuff just now. So I'm going to speak quickly. I'm going to start with the approach to the study, just so you have some context in terms of how the study was approached. So we did take a phenomenon, phenomenological approach to the study. One of those words that time here, but it, it's pretty simple. It's saying that when you go to persons, you want to understand their interpretation of their lived reality. You're not trying to impose on them and on, on your understanding. You want to hear from them how they experience life. And this was especially important in this study because we were asking persons to tell us about their life course, their life history. So you weren't so much focusing on the precision of the facts, so to speak, but you wanted to understand how they felt about something, how they reacted, how they were engaged. And that is, those are the things you remember, because I am sure we all remember which teacher gave us, we can continue to make us when we're growing up, we used to get some of these things. We all remember the first time somebody gave us a family book in that school. We all remember those things. We all remember the first birthday party probably. So those are the things that you wanted to get from persons. So we're focusing on their interactions within the social space. So you wanted to understand their interactions with social institutions, and you also wanted to understand their, their interactions with social processes, particularly social structure. So you wanted to understand how individuals interacted with their families, school, peer group, communities, and you wanted to understand how structural factors such as social mobility came into play to shape their participation in education and their attitudes towards um, tertiary education. So just to bring in a concept, and I'm not a nerd or trying to be very abstract, but I have to fix on cultural reference or cultural reference frame. So we weren't, we didn't want persons just to, and by asking persons how they feel about things, this is what comes up. You don't just get from them how you feel about something, what you did, but you also get from them the frame of reference, the context. So for example, a mother may not be able to live, demonstrate to her child the value of education if she is, say, an uneducated poor mother versus a middle-class tertiary educated mother. She can't demonstrate it in the same way. She can't help the child in the same way. But she knows the importance, so she imitates what she sees. So she'll say to her child, go take up your book, as we say in Adam Patwa. Or if she works in an office, she goes to the more educated person and she says, can you help my child with their, their homework? Can you tell me which school I should pick for um, for paper or whatever. So those, so you get the full gamut of what the person experiences in terms of their cultural ecosystem and not just what they do and what they see. So I said before, we looked at three types of, of respondents. We looked at those who didn't qualify for tertiary education, those who did but chose to bypass, or those who did and delayed. And of course, we use a gender comparative a comparative analysis. So we compared males and females to ensure that it was in fact um, a, a gender-based analysis. So just to start off, um, we'd say in terms of the findings, we found that both men and women are rational. So the whole idea that our men have gone crazy, our men are failing, they're letting down, there may be challenges affecting our men, there may be issues of marginalization, but our men are not failing in the sense that they've, they're, they're hiding under a rock or they've given up. They are simply responding to <coughs> the situation as it is. And when I say rational, a man's approach to tertiary education, a woman's approach to tertiary education is very much based on meeting their needs. So rational in terms of what? Tertiary education is not a part of coping strategies. It's a part of their social mobility 
framework. So if it is that a man is preoccupied or a woman is preoccupied with coping, tertiary education is not part of cultural reference for you. So what we found was, for particularly those who didn't qualify for tertiary education, tertiary education didn't fit into their reference frame because they weren't even thinking about mobility. They were thinking about simply survival and coping. And that was for males and females, even though they survived and coped differently based on gender roles. Um, for those who bypassed, um, they also took a rational approach. They saw where, and the majority did prioritize the completion of secondary education. It was a priority. They and they aligned secondary education with, with preparing the foundation, and that's important. They did not see their learning as ending at secondary education, but what they saw was that tertiary education was not the next step in their in, in their educational um, framework, so to speak. So what they saw was here are my goals, and I can get I can achieve these goals external to tertiary education with a number of them saying that the streets is my school. So I, and within the context of a larger informal economy, a lot of our small to medium sized businesses operate, and a lot of our bypassers were the sons of businessmen, middle class businessmen. This was functional. So it wasn't I'm avoiding tertiary education because I can't bother. I'm avoiding tertiary education because the utility of it doesn't fit into where I'm going. And important to note, these were the respondents that had more defined goals set. So when you look at goal setting, the respondents that had more defined goals in terms of preset goals were those who chose to bypass tertiary education. And that is, in fact, an interesting finding. When we look at those who delayed, we see now, particularly for men, you delay tertiary education because you align tertiary education with mobility. So if you don't align tertiary, you're not, you're not focused on coping, but you align, you don't align tertiary education with your social mobility, you go to the streets or elsewhere to learn. You learn in a business, you learn practically. If you align it with your social mobility, then you delay because you can't afford it or there are other factors. And more and most likely, it, the, the predominant factor was the issue of affordability within the context of responsibilities, etc. That those persons um, did not pursue that, and so these were all rational responses. And for women, it was it, it was very much the same. So, in terms of what influenced these three groups, in terms of them becoming these three groups, the family. The family was critical here. So when we look at, and one of the things, because we're taking this phenomenological approach and we're looking at the cultural reference frame, we weren't caught up with form as much as function. So as much as it's important to understand, and it was critical to understand the family forms because they were associated with function, we found that a family um, actually fulfilling the functions, those typical established functions of the family was more, most critical. So for example, if you had a two-parent home where there was constant violence where the, um, and where the family eventually fractured, you found that there may have been more harm than if, say, a young man was raised by a single parent mother in a very secure setting where he had ontological security. <laughs> so. We, we, we found that to be the case. And so, but again, this does not negate the role of the father in say that setting because we found across the board that where the fathers were involved in the lives of their sons, that their sons had um, engaged more in structured goal setting. And not just goal setting to say, here is my goal, but they actually operationalized pathways towards that goal. Challenge though is, that these were often the fathers who then wanted to pass on um, their businesses, and not just businesses, let me point out, when I say pass on to their sons hereditary rights to, to their careers, this was also outside of businesses. There were fathers who were engaging in public sector employment, who ensured that their sons gained the necessary certification, and then through what we would call links, their sons then, then came in to occupy their roles. 
So that dynamic was there as well. But what you found that when fathers were involved, the fathers tried to lead and to direct their sons towards a particular pathway that, that also had to do with education, but eventually that income earning option. And I point that out because if we're going to speak to young men, we also have to speak to fathers. Fathers are critical in terms of getting by in a tertiary education. So in terms of, so, that, so that's one thing, the function, how the family functioned, where there was greater levels of stability, um, there was more attraction to finish um, and more possibility of completing um, tertiary, I'm sorry, secondary level education, wanting to go to tertiary. But of course, again, family influence, because depending on the type of family and the influence of the father, you may choose not to go to tertiary education as a practical and a rational um, response. For those who did not qualify, for example, most came from families that were fractured. Child shifting was um, a central tenet of these persons' early experiences. And child shifting, again, takes away from your ontological security. You move from place to place. Just think about like rolling stone gathers no moss, but a rolling stone also gets a lot of scratches. That's the reality. That's a good one. So, so, that, so that is a part of it. Then there's negotiation with the school. Again, we found that those respondents who were from middle class backgrounds were better able to negotiate with the schools. And, and the reason why is, is simple. If you think about how families function, they function based on the capital available to them. And when you say capital, we're not talking about just economic capital. We're talking about social and cultural capital. And so a middle class family creates more structures, structure for their children. Bedtime, food meal time, rules, a family that is not middle class oftentimes doesn't have the skills to do it and the options and or the options to do it. And in terms of to the extent that a middle class family has, mother may be outside hustling, a middle class family may have a helper. So all of those come into play. And so what you find though is that that having structure at home that is comparable, compatible with the structured school makes it easier for a child to integrate in the school, male or female. As a matter of fact, it makes it a little bit easier for males, and, and I'll say why. Um, females are socialized to conform. I found the difficulty in accepting that as a female who considers myself quite independent. I always thought I was an independent child. So when I was going through the data, I had to go back over the data just to say, okay, am I seeing this correctly? But it was so. We, we are socialized to conform. So in the school system, we conform. And we don't conform because it, it, we conform out of rationality again. We conform because it works for us. And then I remembered my goddaughter. She's going to kill me that telling her business um, to 24 countries. But when she was younger, she probably doesn't remember this, but her mom came, her mom was telling me the story. My goddaughter went to, she's very independent now, did. And she's been this way from she was a child. So she went to, kind of, um, to this, this kind of daycare setting and early kindergarten and she wasn't her mom came she had no stars so the teacher would put up stars commendation stars my goddaughter had no stars or maybe one star so her mom was like why don't you have any stars and she said because when the teacher says we're so um you know she suggests she doesn't say you have but she said you know maybe you girls should go to sleep but the boys weren't sleeping she decided well i don't want to sleep the boys are not sleeping i'm gonna play with the boys but of course, she was conforming to her gender role expectations, so she got no stars. My goddaughter figured this out. And at first, she was like, I don't care about the stars. I am not conforming. Right. But somewhere along the line, because you know, whatever we say, the girls are our in-group. She started to feel like she was in the out-group now, the boys. So her mother went and she had a lot of stars. So her mother said, what happened here? Oh, I decided to sleep when she told us to sleep. She decided to conform. So the whole idea of women conforming, I, I don't want females to think that it was, um, the females were saying we're conforming because we, we don't have a man or They're conforming in a very functional way because this is what is required of them. And this is how they get through the system. Right, As I think I'm, I am, I am uh, a girl that I interviewed said when she weighed not conforming and conforming, the people who were conforming got more, 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 more gifts and more everything. So she just said, you know, let me take it to, let me just conform. But in my heart, I'm not conforming. <laughs> right. so, so the females did that. 
Um, the male, however, had it um, a little bit more difficult because it's, it's actually the, the behavioral frame for women within the school and even within society generally. You found for most women, it was pretty simple. Simply in the sense that it was easier for the women to understand the rules and to navigate them based on our socialization. What you found for the men is that the men had certain challenges. You tell the men, and this is where we found that even when men chose to be disruptive, the motivation was not disruption. The problem that most of the boys had was that society tells you that you should be dominant. You should create a space for yourself. But then here you find yourself in school, trying to be dominant, trying to create a space for yourself based on the capital that you bring. And that's different based on your social, your social class background, your family form, all of those. And the school system is saying you need to conform. So for boys from middle class homes, particularly the ones who had these businessmen fathers that were negotiators, they were social bargainers, and they were actually um, teaching their sons how to be like this. Those sons navigated the school system pretty well when it came to bargaining. They were able to negotiate with the school system, with the structure of the school, the institutional frame of the school to their advantage. Matter of fact, one said he wrapped the fingers around, the teachers around his fingers because he knew when to say yes, miss, and to smile even though he's thinking, I wonder my way, you know. And so these males were able, they, they sought to establish autonomy and independence and a sense of identity external to the school structure itself from they were in secondary school. And these were the ones who were thinking, who were heading towards bypassing and heading towards clear um, career goals and income earning goals. Then you had the set of males who understood that conformity would help them. They came from homes where they were brought up well, so to speak. They understood from their parents, I don't want the teacher to tell me that you're misbehaving. And they, they saw education as a route to taking them to where they wanted to go. So they kind of integrated themselves in the school system. They became the prefects. They were friendly with the teachers. And they, so their conformity, again, was, fun, was functional. And then you had those who conformed out of indifference. I can't bother with this first time, I'm conforming out of indifference, but these are the boys whose home lives were not given in that sense of security and motivation. And then you had those who did not have the skills to negotiate with the school. They don't understand how to do it, but they understand what it is to be a man, so to speak. And so they're clashing with the school system. They're seen as disruptive. They're seen as having behavioral problems because the, the capacity for them and the school, for the school to negotiate with these, these boys, that is not there and the capacity for those boys to effectively negotiate with the schools, that's not there as well. But a question that lends itself is, these are young people whose job it is to have developed a frame for that engagement. Was it the student's responsibility or was it the school's responsibility? So, 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 Pish, so part of the bottom line is that a lot of the young men who are prominent today were the ones who either manage the school system as in they had the teachers wrapped around their fingers, are the ones who couldn't bother with school at all. Right. And a lot of the ones who conformed and just went through the school system mm -hmm. still end up in the, in, 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 in the economy as not making a lot of money or contributing heavily. So the two extremes yeah. ended up right. there. And that, <clears throat> we found, sends this message to young men that education is really not mine. If the examples I know, right, if John was the guy who just walked up and said, Miss, Miss, you look nice today. Miss, Miss, you look like Miss, you're married again. And, and they didn't do their work, <laughs> right? These were the boys who now operate companies and all of these things, right? Because right through the study, when we interviewed the young men, they said, Show me the volume of examples of the boys who went to school and conformed and so forth, who are doing very well. Right. And it means, therefore, it's the education system that needs to change to be more fluid to everybody rather than to serve the purpose of a few. Right. 
So there was also the impact of the community. But again, this was linked to family form and to type of community. So for example, for again, males who are bypassing who are from middle class homes, and to, to be noted though, a lot of these middle class homes where the fathers were middle class businessmen. Their mo the mothers, quite a number of these mothers were tertiary educated. But these sons would tell you their mother never have their money, any money, so to speak, and they were dependent on their fathers. The fathers were not tertiary education, educate, educated. And these men actually went on to marry educated women in the same breath. But again, these women were, in, were financially dependent on these men who didn't have tertiary education. All right, so, B, so you are educated, but you're, but you're dependent on my money. Yes. All right. <laughs> How do we then pass that on to our boys to say, you know, look at your mom, look at Pisha, mm -hmm. she has a PhD, and so forth and so forth. The child is saying, but uh, dad, uh, when when we go to Disney next week, it's your money though. And so part of what we found was that partnership was not sold enough to children in Jamaica right. for them to understand that, look, you're going to Disney, right, in Florida next week because mommy and daddy put money together and so forth. Father was always seen as the ATM machine, the one you put the card and you take out, stop shaking your head, <laughs> right? And because of that, education in that environment would not appeal to boys who are rationally examining this expectation that everybody have body have of him, that he must have money. And and I remember one of the cases where the boy said, my father told me no money, no love. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and I said, oh God, I hope the father didn't tell it to you a lot of times. He says, I, I, I almost every day, sir. So you can understand the direction that that boy's life would be going and the difficulty with partnering with women mm -hmm. who, are, who would be more likely to have more education and, and less money. And, and, and that is very much the case. We were to, but to, to follow up on your point, Dr. Gale, one of the things that we found about men as well, young men, I remember one respondent came from a middle class business background and chose to go to a tertiary institution and left shortly thereafter. Um, because he could not see the alignment between what was being presented in formal education and uh, the labor market needs. He could not see the practicality, and and he wasn't the only respondent who said this. There, there were there were there are a number of respondents who chose to bypass, even some who delayed, who noted that they for them part of the challenge with education was the whole idea of the relative utility. It's an investment. I spend money on education. I spend the time. What's my opportunity cost here? So one, one part of my opportunity cost is how much I'm going to earn, my return on investment. But another part of my opportunity cost is, okay, my time is up. So <laughs> another part of, I'll, I'll finish this. Another part of my opportunity cost is all the other things that I'm giving up to do this when I could do something else that takes me to my goal. So if my goal is to be um, a businessman who does X, Y, or creates, because they spoke about the whole idea of being creative, of exploring, and, uh, and the tertiary education wasn't facilitating that. And they even brought out the whole idea of the difference between training, skills training, and what they call academic education, and the fact that for them, academic education was not attractive. And I think that has something to do with how we package it. And so in the recommendations, which I'll talk about quickly, <laughs> males need to see tangible benefits of education to see its value, including for small to medium sized businesses in a country with a large informal economy. The argument was greater levels of formal formality should encourage greater participation in tertiary education since there was a disconnect between tertiary education considered formal and the informal sector. The need for males to associate tertiary education with goal setting. And I say that because most males who had clearly defined goals did not see tertiary education as a means to get to those goals. A lot of males who were delaying tertiary education had not yet fully defined their goals. And again, it had to do with the input of particularly the father in goal setting, even though a lot of the males were delayed, were from, had quite stable relationships, but maybe not with a father figure trying to guide them that way. 
So the whole idea of, of being of goal setting, establishing systems where we start helping our students to align tertiary education with goals and, and putting tertiary education as part of our roadmap to practical goals that have in, that earn you incomes that make sense in terms of being a man. Um, dependency into adulthood needs to be permissible for males. So the whole idea of a man being dependent on his parents or even being dependent on his wife is something that within the cultural framework we need to re-examine. Men are not to be dependent on, and, and it is a thing that women say. Women said, I take care of my child. The man takes care of me and, and his child. There needs to be, uh, and in families again, there needs to be a re-examination of the approach to education and addressing divides, um, I said that before, between what's theoretical, and there needs to be more information on tertiary educational offerings, because part of the challenge is that men don't know enough about what is what is there, what are the offerings, and so they, and they need to have that education in a way where they see the alignment with labor market demands. And um, great alignment of meeting gender role identity with tertiary education. How do I achieve my gender role identity as a man if I go to tertiary education? Um, it's easier for women because our gender role identity is more fluid. We have more space to, for it to be a little bit more malleable than for men, even though men are the ones who are socialized to dominate and create their own space, whereas we are to occupy spaces and make those spaces our own. Okay, thank so you the, very much. So the challenge is to make Caribbean men see education as part of the frame of manhood yes. and to end the conflict between masculinity, and which is a creation, by the way, everybody, it wasn't handed down, in, it's not in your DNA, Right, so to, to end the conflict between masculinity and education in a setting right where women have are already married to education, right? Eighty-seven percent of all the women in the data set for volume two says without education I am not complete. That's not the case for men. Not even twenty percent of the men said they needed education to be complete. They said they needed money. Be complete. That is where we're going to leave it, and we're going to see if we take, of course, a couple questions. We are really out of time, um, but we can just facilitate one question, a very brief question from the media. Good just afternoon. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Good afternoon. My name is Roxanne Martin from Sun City Radio. I just have a question for both authors. Um, following up on what you have said, how do we make this appealing at the legislative and the cultural level? Education for men. Education for men. Good <laughs> You want to go ahead or I should go? You go ahead. Um, I think that it it can be appealing, but it depends on. Okay, I should say. Let me say that it it is appealing already. I think we've recognized as a country the whole idea that we change our Bureau of Women Affairs to Bureau of Gender Gender Affairs. The fact that we have taken steps and globally we do try to to ensure that we stay that we focus on more men and women in Jamaica because our dynamics are different from other countries. I think part of the challenge though is the interaction with the global space and also our interactions within country in terms of how we feel that we should deal with, with, with gender-based issues. And I say that because the global space still looks at largely females being the ones who are vulnerable. So oftentimes when you're having those conversations and when, you, when you're in that dialogue where you're thinking of globally how do you fit into this space, you find that there is a little disconnect there. The other issue though I think locally is that whilst we recognize that there are challenges facing our men, I think we also don't want to feel like we're treating them like girls, so we still don't want to address the vulnerabilities of men in a very direct way because then it feels like we're turning them into women. Yes. So, so, so I think culturally we need to. I, I think it's a cultural lag because we, we with a lot of the changes that have happened, but we've not um, adjusted our normative frames. So our, our minority frames to adjust to it. And so you find that a lot of our men's act, men actually and our young boys, they don't know how to be men. They're confused. Which which version of, of maleness do you want? <laughs> right. And, and I think we have to head, and I think this is where I, I want to close uh, the, the launch. 
by saying that one of the one, one of the core findings in every single study throughout is the massive gap between men and women who live together in partnership mm -hmm. compared to men and women who compete, who have gender competitions in their small space, medium space, and the larger space. So if you look at even violence, intimate partner violence, whilst Jamaica on average have 25% of our homes with intimate partner violence, only 3% of the families, irrespective, irrespective of class, irrespective of even education, only 3% of those families have intimate partner violence. And that tells you that if that that has to be the policy moving forward. That we if we have a boy and a girl, we have to drop the 1970s, 80s, and 90s story of saying, Let the girl go on, you can't go to work. We have to begin to focus on both our children. As men and women, we have to learn to live together and work together as a team and to focus in a, in a more neutral and in a more, uh, in a more uh, encouraging uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a neater merger of us respecting each other as simply a human being. And I think when we begin to sell that, and I, I say to people all the time, Jamaica has tremendous promise. If we could sell to a, a peasantry two is better than too many, we can also sell to them that partnership is cheaper than going alone. Take care of yourselves. Again, congratulations to the authors. And I can't stress again where you can get a copy of this book. So you can grab a copy from the UWI Press or via Amazon. On behalf of the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work, and by wider my faculty, I wish to thank UWI Press for assisting us with this launch today. I also wish to thank Juicy Beef Limited, and last but least, not least, Keisha Howell and her fantastic team. I do apologize for running over time. The staff was meant to leave at 3.30, but you must admit that the discussion was quite dynamic and very interesting. Again, thank you for joining us, and do enjoy some Jamaican Juicy Beef patties. Bye. <laughs>